Welcome to the research design workshop for international regulatory frameworks for climate change and environmental management. So this is our first workshop. And in this workshop, we're going to try and unpack the research task that you've got and then the design of your research paper and your presentation of your research proposal. So I want to basically start with the research task give you an overview of the research design template, an example of a completed research design, some tips for choosing a good title, some key tips for good research, how to prepare your research proposal, and discussion of some preliminary ideas. So Candy, we've been talking about her proposal, you might ask for a few ideas about what you guys might be thinking about, and then it'll be helpful for all of us to sort of unpack some of the ideas and how that you might develop that into a research proposal for this course. Okay, so that's an outline of what we're going to do and it'll take us about five, um, 50 minutes. Okay, so our research task, there's two things that you're doing related to research in this course. The first is the research proposal and yeah, only worth 5% but it's basically meant to be a check on whether you're on track for the research paper and you know that the topic for the research paper is to evaluate the effectiveness of the implementation of an international environmental regulatory framework in any country of the world and make two or more policy recommendations for how the implementation can be improved. Um, undergrads have got um, two to 3,000 words and postgrads have got three to 4,000 words. It's due in about six weeks on the 10th of January. Okay, so for that research task, uh, obviously set out in more detail in the ECP, don't want to dwell on that in terms of the criteria and standards. I ran through this briefly in lecture one, but for the research proposal, you can either present it in person or you can just upload two documents to the Blackboard site and I can give you online feedback or you can talk to me on the phone too, like next week, uh, if you've got any questions about it. I really want with the proposal that it's not stressful, it's really about giving you early guidance about whether you're on track whether you've got a topic that is, um, I call it the Goldilocks topic. So uh, in our culture, many people know the Goldilocks, the story of Goldilocks, who went in and tasted, you know, uh, into the bear's house and with the porridge. Um, there was, you know, one bowl of porridge was too hot, one bowl of porridge was too cold, and baby bear's porridge was just right, and she ate it all up. So uh, same with research, any advanced research, because you guys now, you know, you've, in a lot of your academic careers, you know, at school and, and say an undergraduate, you're given a topic and then told to go and research it. The, one of the big transitions that you face in moving to more advanced research is that you're not given a topic. And the hard thing, particularly with postgraduate research, is to identify a topic that's big enough that it's significant, but not too big that it's impossible to do. And so if you go on to say a PhD, a classic in PhDs is for people to um, start wanting to you know, answer this massive question that will revolutionize the world. And then over the course of three years, they gradually narrow their question down to that they're basically changing the light bulb in the room. Not quite that extreme, but uh, narrowing down your topic is normal in advanced research. And it's easy to go too big and ask a question that you can't possibly answer in the time and space you've got available, even if it's a PhD with, say, three years to do it in, full time. So you guys have only got six weeks, and you need to identify something that is big enough that it can you know, get good marks and be an interesting topic for you, at the same time as not being too big that you can't do it. So that's an important balancing exercise, and it's deliberately built into the question for you in that it's open-ended, um, but you have to identify what you are going to do. So um, I want to give you that feedback and, uh, and from past experience in different courses, most people will be on track and a few people will need some guidance on, you know, what you're doing. It sounds great, but it's too big for six weeks, so let's narrow it down. You were going to look at, say, three World Heritage Areas and compare them. Let's start with one and just focus on in on it and don't worry about doing the other two because there be, there won't simply be the time and space available to do it. That's a sort of example of the sort of feedback that I expect to give. Okay, so 
um, you're just marked on clarity and um, your presentation. And it's nothing about the significance or getting the right question. It's just really about, yeah, some easy, easy marks it should be regarded as, but mainly about helping you. Okay, so the two things you've got to do, you've got to um, fill out this research design template. So this was something that I, uh, so again, it's on the Blackboard site. Um, the research design template, you can just open it up and you've got a Word document. So download it, put in your name, your email, the date in your course. Um, that's just a little research design diagram. It was just something from a book on research design that I liked about the research questions. Because in advanced research, uh, often supervisors will talk to you about what are your research questions. So identify what you're asking is a really important component of um, advanced research. So I've just put in some headings. It's originally, I developed this for my own PhD, uh, and it was based on work in a couple of books, particularly Practical Research Methods and Real, Real World Research by Colin Robson. And so these sorts of topics just come from those books. So what's your title? And, you know, you might think a title, it's not that important, but um, you know yourself that when you're doing research, so you Google something, the number of things you just scroll by because they don't catch you in the title, you think, no, that's not relevant, that's not relevant, that's not what I want. So titles are actually really important in terms of drawing people in to your research and having people read what you've written. So think about the title, um, talk more about that in a moment. Um, two, what's the purpose or objective of the research? What are you trying to achieve? Third, what is the context and significance of the research? And fourth, what are the research questions and the research methods and the sampling strategy, timeline and references? So I wrote this as a generic template for, I used to give it to students if they're an honours student or a master's student doing you know, a research paper. So it's written for any advanced research. For you, a lot of the questions are obvious from the task you're given. Can I just give you an example? Um, there's a, I've given you a worked example. <coughs> so I've written it, uh, and um, I've got there an example of a title. Um, Conserving biodiversity in Queensland. And I've crossed that out and put the comment, that topic needs to be narrowed because it's too wide for the time and space. So if I was looking at conserving biodiversity in Queensland and I had six weeks to research that and um, you know, three to 4,000 words to do it, then I can't do that topic in the time and space available. So um, the second title I've put is Evaluating the Effectiveness of Implementing the Biodiversity Convention, Regulation of Fire Regimes in Queensland, Australia. So that's a, what are your comments on that title? Is it an attractive title? Not really, is it? It's pretty clunky. It's long. It sounds really staid. Um, but it would be okay. At least it tells the reader what it's about. For our purposes, you could have something like evaluating the implementation of the World Heritage Convention in China, a case study of and identify the World Heritage Site you're going to evaluate. Or if you're looking at the Philippines, you know, I think of with the title, think of key words in your topic and then just try and bring them into some catchy sort of interesting summary of it in 10 words or less. So if you're studying something in Australia, then the word Australia or Queensland should be in your title. Uh, and then, you know, if you're studying a particular species like um, black-throated finch, then, you know, put that in the title as well. So key words that are going to attract in a reader that's looking at those things in the future. Okay, so title. What's the proposed objective of research? To evaluate the effectiveness of the implementation of the Biodiversity Convention focusing on fire management in Queensland, Australia. So that really comes from my topic I've given you. So you can pretty well take this template and copy across quite a bit of it um, to yours because you're basically doing the same thing as I've given you this um, example for. So the content and significance is important. So showing that you're topic is actually important, why it's important. 
So try and explain the context and significance of it in you know, a few points. So here I've said Article 8 of the Biodiversity Convention basically says, um, imposes a general obligation on Australia to conserve biodiversity. Fire regimes are re regarded as important for many Australian ecosystems and altered fire regimes uh, are recognised as a pressure on biodiversity and there's a reference for that. There appears to be an important gap in Queensland for environmental regulatory framework because outside of the 4% of states in protected areas, there's little consideration of ecological matters in controlling fire regimes. Um, basically, we just burn things to reduce hazards to people and infrastructure. That's the main reason why we burn. And you can go out if you're a landholder and get a permit. And the main thing that they'll be looking for is, you know, you're not going to burn on a hot, windy day where the fire is going to you know, burn out your neighbour's property, you know, your permit will be li limited to burning on, you know, virtually still conditions in relatively cool times uh, so that the fire doesn't get away. So fire permits are issued to landholders, you know, not looking at, okay, well, this is autumn and, you know, there's going to be flowering and melaleucas in that time and we shouldn't allow burning of it because it's going to reduce all of the the food that's available to, you know, butterflies and birds that, you know, depend on melaleucas. So we should limit our burning in these ecosystems at this time. Like, that doesn't happen. So um, what I'm basically trying to set up in that, explaining the context there is, like, it's recognised as important, but we don't do it. So there's a gap. So it's significant. Does that...? And then I've talked about pressure state response. In tomorrow's workshop, I'm going to talk more about developing policy recommendations and we'll talk about different frameworks for evaluations, things like pressure state response uh, and the like. So I'll park that in policy recommendations until tomorrow. But you get the idea with significance. So why is your topic significant? So like um, Candy uh, is looking at doing, uh, so she's from China and she's looking at doing um, uh, air quality in Beijing. So an international framework that she might look at um, could be something like the Sustainable Development Goals. So it doesn't have to be a convention. It can be as broad as Sustainable Development or the Sustainable Development Goals. So if you wanted to do pollution in your home country, you could use the SDGs and then look at their implementation or what is being done. And so Candy's interested in looking at um, air pollution in Beijing and so, you know, the context is significant of this section could be things like, you know, Beijing is a mega city of how many people live in Beijing? Let's just say 10 million, 20 million, 20 million. So 20 million people live in Beijing. Um, it's commonly um, regarded as one of the most heavily polluted cities in the world. It commonly has, you know, air pollution exceeding world health standards by X, you know, there are seen to be 200,000 premature deaths per year due to air pollution in Beijing. I'm just making those statistics up, but, you know, you could set that out in terms of context and significance and put in something about, like, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, under the Sustainable Development Goals, this, um, China has agreed to, you know, address um, pollution concerns and health concerns for its population. So see how the content significance then becomes pretty obvious. It's a big problem affecting a lot of people and it's a, you know, it's a big deal. Everyone happy with that? Um, okay, so what are the research questions? And you could pretty well just copy the two that have got there because your question has two components. You have to evaluate the effectiveness and you have to make two or more policy recommendations. So your research questions can just basically be turned into whatever your topic is, but in those two components. So how effective in conserving biodiversity is the current regulation of fire regimes in Queensland? Is my first question. And then how can the current regulation of fire regimes in Queensland be improved for conserving biodiversity? For Candy's problem in Beijing, it could be, you know, how effective is China's regime for controlling air pollution um, uh, and implementing the sustainable development goals for air pollution? Um, how can China's current um, regime for air pollution be improved? So they could be the two questions, two parts of the task you've got. 
Does that make sense? So research questions are important, particularly for the next step, because what, when you look at advanced research and people say, well, you know, come up with your research questions, that's the first step to then identifying how you're going to answer those questions. So, and you answer them through your research methods. So typically in the past, you might have used just a literature survey. So, you know, you've gone to the library, you've done a Google search of the topic, you find what other people have written and you write it up. So in advanced research, you typically ask to go out and find some new data. So not just look at what other people have written, but bring in some new information and say something new. And that's a really important part of your marking criteria for this and what I'll really be looking for. So there's different ways you can do. Gather primary data. You can go out to the field. So Candy might go back to Beijing, get an air quality meter, and over 10 days measure you know, PPM 2.5 or something, um, and then plot, plot that in, you know, in her paper. And she says, on the 10 days that it was measured, Beijing's air pollution grossly exceeded the, um, the international standards and I compared it to the government website about air pollution and the government website said everything was fine uh, and there is this mismatch between what I, what I measured and what the government was saying uh, and this has huge implications for health. You know? And then you can see how that's going to lead on to some recommendations about you might you know, lead on to a recommendation about how government monitoring needs to be improved or something like that. Does that make sense? Okay, so the research methods, there's many different research methods. You can go out into the field and actually measure something. Uh, another common method, what are the other common research methods? They're commonly used. Okay, I'll give you an example of one. Who Put your hand up if you think that a healthy environment is important. Okay, have we got any hands down to that question? Okay, so we've got universal agreement. So what have I done with that? What was my, my uh, if my question was what are public attitudes, let's just say I want to gain an understanding of public attitudes to a healthy environment. So what research method have I just used? A survey. A survey. Um, now, in our class, we've got, you know, my research question is about global attitudes. So what is a good thing about my survey of our class? We've got lots of people from around the world. So what's a bad thing about my survey in terms of bias? Age. I actually hadn't thought of that one, but yeah, you guys are all... Spring chickens, like old crusty like me. No, I hadn't thought of age. We're all studying a course on environmental management. So do you think that we might be a representative sample of the global population? Probably not. So if you were looking at something like a survey, then issues like bias, you know, how big your sample should be, how you gain it, how you avoid, uh, you know, skewing. So so if you went out and just surveyed your friends um, of, you know, their attitude to the environment, are there any problems with that? Well, A, they're your friends, so they're all going to be really nice. Um, and not everyone in the world is really nice. But also, you know, you are concerned about the environment, so probably you are around people that also share similar values to you. So just surveying your friends isn't a random sample, is it? So you might have bias hidden in your sample. But that's an example of gathering primary data that you can then use as evidence to justify you know, some sort of conclusion, some finding of fact. So there's many different methods that you know, can be used. Surveys is a classic one. For our purposes, you don't need to do anything like that. Okay? You don't need to do any surveys. Candy doesn't need to go to Beijing and stand there with an air quality meter. You don't need to gather any data from the actual real world. Um, what you can do, and what mostly I recommend for the purposes of our course, is to, within your topic, um, most people will choose things around world... Um, from past um, courses, most people choose around something like World Heritage, the Ramsar Convention, 
um, biodiversity and you know um, conservation, those sorts of things, or fisheries. Um, so people choose topics in. Um, within that, you know, you identify the country, you identify the area that you want to study, and then focus down on a case study of something. So. Um, with Candy's example, she's, you know, your, your question is about how is China implementing the um, sustainable development goals for air pollution? She's doing a case study of Beijing. She can justify the case study because it's, you know, such an important city. Uh, and she's, but she's using it um, for the purposes of gathering, you know, information from the real world. The real world is messy and complex. But she could use, you know, reports about air quality in Beijing, um, gather together that sort of information. So the primary data you can gain from other sources. But by looking at a, a case study and looking at how regulation is addressing the problems of air pollution, you can come up with some evidence-based conclusions, which is really what I'm looking for. So case study is the, the logical sort of um, method. So here, I've actually listed two research methods. I'm going to do a literature review, uh, and I'm also going to do a case study of particular instances where poor regulation of fire regimes has affected biodiversity in Queensland based on the available published literature. So I was going to do a case study of something like the black-throated finch or the like. And then there's no field work, interviews, surveys, or primary data collection will be undertaken as it's beyond the time, space, and resources available. So you guys can all use that same line. You don't have to do any primary data collection. Um, a case study is probably the easiest way that you can meet the um, marking criteria, um, bring together some you know, real world data, make some um, conclusions that are based on evidence. Does that sound okay? Okay, and then the other questions really relate to um, you know, broadly um, as I said, this was a generic template for other, you know, for anyone doing advanced research. So the sampling strategy, I've just defined it as data will be collected from the peer-reviewed literature and government publications only. Um, Candy mentioned to me that, you know, could she use um, Chinese publications? And I said, yep, that's completely fine. Just in your references list, translate the title into English. You can include it, you know, the Mandarin title as well, but you know, it might be Government of China 2018, you know, Air Quality in Beijing is the title of the report, published by the, you know, Chinese Ministry for Environment Protection um, in Beijing. And then, you know, you could also have the, but you know, anything in any language, just translated into English and yeah, gather data in that way. Uh, and then in this, I've just included some references. So that's the research design template. The Important things are, you know, identify your topic, explain its significance. Uh, the research questions really fall out of the task you're given, and the research methods case study is the easiest one. But I just want you to be thinking about, okay, those issues because they're, um, if you haven't like done a lot of advanced research, those research questions and then choosing your methods are a critical step. Uh, and the basic thing with the um, questions and the methods is they should match. If your question, your methods basically should give you an ability to answer the question you're asked. And if you don't, if you can't see that in the research design, then you've got a problem. Either you've got to narrow the question or you've got to change or add to your methods. So I say that again. So if you've got a, say your question was, what are the global attitudes to the environment and you are going to survey, you know, you decide you're going to do a survey of um, people in your street and let's just say you're an Australian, you're going to walk down the street and survey people, then your question is about global attitudes but your survey is limited to an Australian audience so there's a mismatch between your question and your method and that's a problem for your research design. Cool. Okay, so that's the research design template. Any questions on that? And you'll, I'm sure that you will have questions as we go along. But again, it's, um, you can email me, talk to me in class. 
Uh, does anyone have an idea uh, about what they run through Candy's one? Does anyone else have an idea now about the sort of topic that they might be you know, interested in? And I really emphasise, choose a country that you're from and choose a topic that you are interested in. And I really want you to choose something that you are interested in because I'm flexible. You can do anything. I don't, really, I don't mind. The research is about helping you. It's not really about the answers you get. It's about you being interested in it and finding out something that's useful. Yep? No, you can. Doesn't have to be. Yeah, good question. Uh, does the uh, topic have to be about climate change? The simple answer is no. Um, you can do anything. So you could do fisheries. You could do. And if you're not really interested in a pure, like Candy's one is really about, um, you know, human health, more than you know. Natural environment. Uh, I would emphasise that it doesn't. You don't have to use a convention that we're covering in the main part, you know, this course. You can use other conventions. Uh, and you can also use the sustainable development goals if you really want to look at human health. So it gives you an, um, a huge list of things from waste management through to, you know, air pollution. So the sustainable development goals broadly fits within the topic of, you know, international regulatory framework, even though it's not a binding convention. It's just a UN resolution, but it's still important. So anyone want to volunteer what your topic might be? And we can brainstorm it? Yes? Um, I'm just working on uh, Ramsar's uh, convention. Yes, and which country are you from, Ramsar Convention? Cambodia. You're from Cambodia? Yeah. Yep. And so Cambodia's uh, signed and ratified the Ramsar Convention, I'm sure. Um, do you know any Ramsar sites within Cambodia? Yes. Could I only choose one site or have to Do you know how many sites, um, Ramsar sites? There's four Ramsar sites. And do you work in the area in Cambodia? Are you working for government or working um, in Ramsar Convention? Uh, no. No? I'm working for a non-government organisation. Non-government organisation? That's great. OK. So... Immediately, I think, OK, you're from Cambodia. That's fantastic to then choose Cambodia because you won't have any language or cultural problems or barriers. Um, second, uh, there's four Ramsar sites. So it's already great that you've, okay, you've got your country. That's easy. You're interested in Ramsar, so you've got that convention. That's easy. You've got four sites. Um, so choose one of them. And I would recommend choosing the one maybe that you've visited or that is closest to your home or so, in some way that you think is really interesting. And so your broad question is, how, you know, how effective is Cambodia in implementing the Ramsar Convention? And then you are going to um, evaluate or answer that question through a case study of one of the Ramsar sites within Cambodia. And so you're just going to look at that one and say that either that's representative or there's some reason why it gives you useful lesson, lessons for how um, Cambodia is doing. So that sounds like a really, you know, if, if you gave that to me in a research proposal, I would be saying, great, you're clear on what you're doing, that sounds achievable, uh, and fine, tick to that as a topic. Does everyone see what we've done there? So we've just identified the country, we've identified the convention, we've identified how we're going to you know, examine the topic and narrow it down to something that's achievable. Anyone else? No, you don't. Uh, so, great question. Uh, so, do you have to evaluate each article? Um, are you thinking about a particular convention? Um, I'm not really sure yet, but like, well, you just want to go to that state. I've got lots of articles, so do we pick particular ones? Sorry, great question. Um, uh, do you have to pick one? Often, the conventions really boil down to some broad 
um, you know, obligations. So you could really just look at one of the obligations under it if there were multiple ones. Uh, often you'll also find that, say, say you wanted to look at biodiversity conservation in a particular area, and you might be looking at a World Heritage Site, and there are obligations imposed under the World Heritage Convention. There's also obligations imposed under the Biodiversity Convention. If it's a coastal marine area, then there's also obligations imposed under UNCLOS. So there are multiple obligations that are technically imposed upon it. And how you would deal with that is just identify that there's multiple obligations and that you are going to focus on, say, the World Heritage Convention because that is the most significant, um, because it's a World Heritage Site that you're looking at. Um, so there can be multiple obligations, but generally they're all consistent. Yeah, does that make sense? Other questions? Okay, I'll keep moving along. Um, and if you think about, we'll have more opportunity to talk through ideas as we go. So don't, um, if you've got an idea that it's sort of growing, then let it grow and we'll come back to it. Okay, so that's the template. And um, also um, want you to produce some slides. Um, they, it can be a PDF, but you know, you could do it in PowerPoint and then just convert it to PDF and upload it. And uh, you can look at these recordings that are available, the link is on the Blackboard site, to see some people actually presenting in the class about what they were proposing they would do, and then questions that I had for them, and you know, there's that little recording. But you don't have to do that. You can, if you want, just upload your template and your slides to the Blackboard site. And the slides um, typically will have like a title page, like say, you know, um, say Candy with your topic, you know, um, um, improving air quality in Beijing um, might be your title. And, um, you know, you've got a picture with that title on it and, you know, your name and a picture of, you know, Beijing really smogged out, you know, where you can't even see the buildings and, you know, it's obvious why that's an important topic, um, you know, in terms of communicating. Then your next slide might be a picture of China, identifying where Beijing is. Uh, and then the next slide might be, you know, a graph showing, you know, air quality in Beijing and how bad it is. Uh, and then a slide, another slide of, you know, another picture of Beijing showing um, you know, again, you know, smoke billowing out or something like that. So it might only be say five slides. Um, you don't have to repeat all, all the, of the questions and text because I've already got that in the research design template. I just want you to think about how would I present this visually. So the slides are really just a visual presentation. I've got the text. So just at least a map and a few relevant pictures. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, I've already answered that question in lecture one. Uh, so the research essay task we've already talked about um, in the criteria and standards. The policy recommendations are an important component of it. We'll talk about that more in the workshop tomorrow. There's examples of past student research papers available on the Blackboard site. So, whoops. So yeah, if you go to the research essays, um, the criteria and standards, and so yeah, there's all these sorts of examples um, of past students who gave me obviously permission to use their um, papers for uh, examples for, for future classes. So this was a student talking about um, Southern Bluefin Tuna, an evaluation of the international management framework. You can see a bit of a play on words, turbulent times for the southern bluefin tuna. And um, he goes straight into the, the text of it with a few graphs and the like, a few diagrams, management effectiveness. So these, exa these are just examples. They're, you don't have to, you know, like you might want to have a table of contents at the front. He doesn't have one. They're just examples. They're not you know, written in stone that you've got to copy exactly what they did. I just put them there as examples of what people have done in the past. Cool. And there's some examples from um, uh, WA Fisheries 
Uh, and I've also put the marking sheets there. Those students gave permission for me to, you know, also show what feedback they got and, and how their paper could be improved. Um, there's one on a ten, Tanzanian Ramsar site, Ramsar in the Philippines, Ramsar in Austria, and a Chinese lake um, protection. So, uh, yeah, go and have a look at those, and hopefully they'll give you ideas about, you know, we don't no longer have cover sheets, but you can see here she's got a, a nice cover page, and then a table of contents, and a framework, basically a clear framework, um, clearly set out, um, well written. Um, yep. Any questions on basically what we're working towards? Something like that, you know, uh, on a topic that, you know, you're interested in is really what I want. Okay, so those examples are there. Um, there's also a really good report. I put the link up to it, the Protected Planet Report. It's a recent report um, produced under the Convention of Biological Diversity. Um, it's, got a, it's really interesting, I think, and you can have a look at Chapter 5, pages 22 to 27, which is a really good summary about um, its evaluation, the evaluation framework that was used and recommendations that come from it. Um, I put the link up on the Blackboard site. I just want to emphasise that evaluating effectiveness of policy is a core function that a lot of government does. You know, so as part of a normal policy cycle, you implement policies and then you review how well they're doing and you try and come up ways of doing things more efficiently and better. So what you're doing in this research paper is something that governments do all of the time. So, um, yeah, we've talked about the research design template, uh, an example of the completed research design. Um, in terms of the title, um, I mentioned before, it should be short and accurate um, to let the readers know what your title, what your research is about. Um, you can try and make it catchy, engaging and interesting um, to draw readers in. I think actually some of the best titles um, tell the reader your key message in the title. And, but you don't have to be stressed about it, e even if your title is simply evaluating effectiveness of X, Y, Z. You just tell us what you're doing. It doesn't have to be catchy and, and anything beyond just describing what you're doing. Um, yeah, and tells the reader the main point of conclusion in the title is a good tip as well. And the tip that I'd suggest for a good title is think about the keywords that are critical to include for readers to know what your topic is about. So say for Candy's research, China, Beijing, air quality or air pollution, they're all key, key terms. So think about the keywords and then try and arrange them in an interesting you know, title. It might be catchy, you know, like, you know, choking on smog, colon, you know, Beijing's measures to improve air quality, something like that, or it could, could be more mundane. But just think about the keywords and um, work it out from there. Okay, some tips for good research. Um, decide, in your deciding your research topic, draw upon your background, interests and strengths. Pace your research and allow time for reflection and synthesis at the end. So please don't get to like, you know, finishing it the night before. It's really good if you could at least finish it a day before and, you know, just put it to one side and spend a bit of time synthesizing because that's when you get valuable insights. When you've finished your literature review, you've finished your case study and you're thinking, how can this be improved? What are the recommendations that I can make that will really make a difference? knowing the culture that, you know, affects government in this area. Um, what can I do? So synthesise and reflect. It's really important. And you won't get that if you're finishing, you know, actually writing at 3 a.m. the day before it's due. Um, yeah, go beyond merely a literature review and use methods that involve gathering and presenting data and information about the real world, so a case study. Um, and the methods you choose should be capable of answering the research questions you've asked. And your conclusions and recommendations should be justified by the information and data you present in your research paper. And that's the most common feedback that we give is that to people is that your conclusions are not justified by the information you've presented. So there's got to be a, you know, your, your research has got to make sense. So if you identify a problem 
and that's reflected in a recommendation. But if a recommendation just sort of appears in the list of recommendations, but there's no evidence that that's a problem in the body of your research, then there's this mismatch between the evidence you've presented and why you made this recommendation. So they should match up. Um, yeah, draw upon your background strengths. Um, so play to your strengths, so you know, choose a country you're from where you don't have language barriers, maybe an area you've worked in. As an example, this was a student a few years ago, Carl French, uh, and he was really into turtles. Uh, and conservation, you know, volunteer work. He was working for Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service. So he was working in Gladstone. He was a project officer for uh, Conservation Volunteers Australia. He just completed a re-veg project. Um, and yeah, he was really into turtles. So his topic was about turtles. So play to your strengths. Choose something that, you know, if you're interested in it, if you already know something about it, you're already a long way into your research. So you can get quickly to an advanced level. If you're choosing a topic that you know nothing about, that's okay, but it's gonna be hard for you to do really well in it because you've got so much ground to make up. So choose a topic, play to your strengths is how I'd say it. Uh, you pace yourself, and I like to aim to have a complete working draft finished a week or at least a few days before. I hate trying to, particularly with court, I hate finishing a document on the day it's due because there's always errors in it. It's great if you can finish it the day before and then reread it the next day and then fix up those errors and then put it in. Yep, so go beyond merely a literature review. Use a case study would be the main method that most people will use. And yeah, an in-depth study of a particular situation rather than a sweeping statistical survey. So, you know, if you're looking at Ramsar in the Philippines, choose one of the Ramsar sites and look at things like the pressures on it, what's its current state, how well is it being managed. And yeah, so in my PhD, I looked at um, a case study of, I, was, I looked at laws, evaluating the effectiveness of um, environmental law was my topic. And I did a, a chapter of my PhD was looking at, um, a case study of laws protecting the Great Barrier Reef. And what I did in that was a, what I call a nested case study. So the case study was about laws protecting the Great Barrier Reef. Then within that, I did a catchment because the Great Barrier Reef is such a big area. I did a particular catchment. And then within that, I did a particular development within that catchment. So can you see, and I justified each step. I justified the first one by saying the Great Barrier Reef is a really important and valuable and useful as a case study in its own right. Um, the catchment I chose, I justified on the basis that it was representative of catchments elsewhere along the reef. And then the development was also representative of development in the catchment. So I justified each step down, but it meant that instead of trying to do every development in the entire coastline for the last 20 years, it brought the research down to a manageable level. So, Field work is encouraged but not essential. Here's a student of mine, Jamie, uh, up in the Burnett River looking for invertebrates um, for, as part of her honours study. Um, so if you do want to do field work, please let me know because uh, I want you to be safe and there might be some workplace health and safety issues and the like. You don't have to, but if you are, if you want to, please let me know. So if, for instance, if you want to, if you want to do sort of the Morton Bay Ramsar wetland, and you want to go out and you know take some pictures of the like. I'm not, you know, worried about that. But you know, if you're going to do something that's, you know, involving risks, then let me know. Um, and yeah, there's plenty of data published. But something like that, going out and taking a picture of the site you're studying, fine. Or if you're going home for the holidays and you're going to you're able to visit a site, then sure, go and take some pictures there. But you can also get them off Google Earth. Um, you know, so take pictures and those sorts of things from there. So yeah, the methods you choose should be capable of answering the research questions you've asked and be wary of bias in any method you choose. Yep. So I just want to wrap up. Um, yeah, for your research presentation, complete the two documents. You can either present it at the end of next week or you can upload it to the Blackboard site. and. Two to five slides basically explaining your topic in pictures.
with a map. And you either hand it up when you present it in person or upload it to the Blackboard site. Um, just about out of time, but does anyone have an idea that they wanted to, you know, that your potential um, topic? We've worked through candies, we've worked through um, Philippines example. Can you see how for both of those we just wanted to identify an international framework, um, then identify a case study within that that we're going to use and that it you know, makes sense and that it's capable of basically being answered in the next six weeks with the time and space and resources you've got available. And if you can say yes to all of those things, then I'm going to say that's a fine topic. And whatever you do within those framework, I'm happy with. So that's our research design workshop. Are there any questions at this point? If you want to come and chat with me um, after, like right now, about your ideas that you, you felt a bit nervous about speaking to the whole class, but you want to bounce a few ideas off me, then I'm going to be here. So come and bounce your ideas off me or over the next few days. Uh, if you want to do that, more than happy to chat anytime. And anyone listening to the recording, you can either email me or give me a call. Happy to chat about your ideas. Yep. Yep, so often with domestic laws, you mightn't get a specific reference to the international framework, but if it's a measure essentially achieving those things, uh, then you can look at it. It doesn't have to specifically say, we're doing this to achieve the Kyoto Protocol or some other international framework. It can be, it doesn't have to recognise that. It, yep. Okay, thanks everyone, and for those who are coming tomorrow, I will see you tomorrow. <laughs>